Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at an Arcam Alpha 8R. The amplifier retailed back in 1999 at £379.90 and in terms of general specifications the amplifier will deliver a power output of 50 watts into 8 ohms but this increases up to 100 watts if you connect 4 ohm speakers and then frequency response is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and then total harmonic distortion comes in at 0.01%. For input sensitivity, for the line inputs, you're looking at 275 millivolts. But this amplifier has the ability to select a moving magnet type cartridge input, and that will have an input sensitivity then for 3, mil, three millivolts, and that is selectable from the rear. You just need to uh, just select line or moving magnet, and it will just select the appropriate circuitry internally. The amplifier also has a pre-amplifier output, so this is 540 millivolts, and full speaker range from 4 ohms all the way up to 16 ohms. Now with the Alpha 8R, uh, ladder units had something called a processor function switch, which is located on the rear, and we sort of mentioned this in the repair tutorial as well, and it's also shown being disassembled. The purpose of the switch, and um, there's two selections, so one says processor, and then the other one says normal. So if you're operating the amplifier as an integrated amplifier, then you would normally select the normal. If you're connecting maybe the amplifier to an AV receiver, then you would then move the switch across then to processor. And what it's doing then is it's just fixing the gain of the amplifier. And that's the purpose of it. And then for dimensions, height wise, you're looking at 85 millimeters. Width 430 and depth comes in at 330. And then weight, it's not too heavy, so 4.5 kilograms overall. Now the amplifier, the, or the 8R, does support a remote control function. And it comes with like a small little handy, sort of palm-sized remote control, but it has two functions on there. The first one is to increase and decrease the volume control. And um, because the amplifier is microprocessor-based, you can also place the amplifier into mute mode, and the power LED will switch from green to amber to indicate that it's in mute. It doesn't operate any of the input channel selection or any of the other controls, and those controls are all manual. When you look at the front fascia, you have a headphone socket, and this is a quarter inch jack. And then on the rear, you have two sets of speaker terminals. You can see also here, you can see SP2. So that's speaker set two, and one set is switched and one is unswitched. So just to clarify what that means, Switch means that if I connect the headphones to it, it will disconnect the rear connected speakers. And then if it's, of course, unswitched, then it would not. And then you have separate bass, treble and balance controls. And you also have a direct mode. So clarification on that, that just disables the internal tone control circuits. If you go direct, if the button is not pressed, then all the front controls will be operational. And you can also have a tape input as well. Now, what was the issue with the amplifier when it came into the workshop? Well, the customer had had a failure of the input protection fuse on the mains power, and the rating of that fuse is thermal delay or time delay, which is rated at 1.25 amps. And correctly, the customer had gone off and purchased some replacement fuses of exactly the same type, which is good, uh, inserted it, but unfortunately on power up, the fuse had blown again. Now, the reason for the fuse failure it could be linked, of course, maybe to an issue with the power transformer or maybe the secondary rectifier diodes. But the most common issue tends to be relating to either the left or right channel MOSFETs failing. And that's what happened here. But we'll go into more detail in a little while. The first thing I sort of want to draw your attention to is these fuse holders. What you'll find is either side of them, they're 20 millimeter fuse holders, 5 millimeter diameter. And the spring tabs either side, which clamp onto the ends of the fuses, over time can just sort of lose their springiness. And what will happen is you'll get an intermittent contact being made with one side of the fuse. And I've seen many amplifiers like this that come in with that fault. What I'd always advise you to do is just to take a pair of needle nose pliers and you can just squeeze in either end of the fuse holder. And then when you put the new fuse in, it will snap into place and it's a really, really positive connection. On very older amplifiers, you may try to just squeeze in the end tabs and one of them breaks off because the metal has become brittle. In that case, all you can do is to replace them. But 
Just inside, if you have any amplifiers that use these types of fuse holders, just verify mechanically that you have that good connection with the fuse. Now, I often talk about building longevity into repairs. And what that relates to is additional work that you can carry out when you're repairing an amplifier, just to ensure that once the fault has been fixed, you don't have any other underlying issues, which tend to be more age related. And these amplifiers, as I said, 1999, you know, that amplifier has been in good service for decades. So there's a bit of remedial work that you need to carry out. The first one is that you need to look at the circuit board. Now, to remove the circuit board is relatively easy. If you turn the amplifier around, you have a series of fixing screws for the rear plate and there's three on the bottom and two either side. And then you have the large fixing bolt for the toroidal transformer that can be easily removed. And then when you look from the top of the main circuit board, you'll see that there's three silver fixing screws and one towards where the speaker selection relay is. So remove those four. And then it's a case of just removing four screws left and right for the plastic bezel. And then what you can do is just lift up the amplifier slightly from the front and then just release the plastic tabs. And then you can slide away once you've removed the volume, treble, bass and um, balance control knobs. And you can see I'm showing this in the video. And then once that, once that is then removed, you can then remove two other fixing screws which are on the cage which are used to mount the user control potentiometers. Just a point with regard to the control knobs, you'll also find that when you remove them and you just pull them off, you'll find that there's a felt dust cover behind. Just make sure that you don't sort of lose any of those. And then once that's done, if you then start to lift up the uh, amplifier board, and you can do this by holding onto the toroidal transformer which is stuck via a self adhesive pad to the board, you'll see that there's one support pillar on the left hand side. Just squeeze that, that in and then the board can be extracted then. And then once you've done that, it's a relatively straightforward procedure just to turn the board over. And then what I'm showing here are the input RCA sockets. And you'll always find cracking around there. So I've just took the time then to resolder all of those and then just move across the board. You'll also find commonly dry joints on the output MOSFETs and even on the speaker terminals. And then also as inside, just check the locking nuts on the rear of the speaker terminals as well. Sometimes they can become slightly loose. Then resolder the dry joint connections, which you'll find on the input power socket. And then the next part is the headphone socket. Always dry joints there, reflow those. And then also reflow the solder connections on the user control potentiometers. Sometimes this is overlooked and what you will find is there will be cracks around the pins of the potentiometers. And then also look at the tape switch, the direct mode switch, and then also SP2 switch. You'll find dry joints on those and then resolder. And then the next part is the input selection switch. And I'll show this in the video where the input selection switch has been removed. And then what I also show is the selection switch completely disassembled. Now, the reason for that is often when these amplifiers come up for sale, maybe on auction websites or maybe on forums, customers will report that they have intermittent input loss of signal. And if they just simply move the input selection left or right slightly, they can restore it. And what, or well, the reason for that is they could be dry joints, which is very common on this series of amplifier on the pins of the switch. But more commonly, when you take the switch apart, what you'll find is there is oxidization on the wafers of the switch. And that was the issue here. Not a huge amount, but enough to cause problems. So it's a case of just using a fiberglass pencil, just clean them all up, and then you can spray deoxid just in air, uh, just make sure that those contacts, you know, don't have any sort of residual from the fiberglass pencil. And then just using a high grade lubricating grease, just a smear of it because they're mechanical contacts and they're designed to slip. Just to make sure that you have that longevity that I mentioned uh, a moment ago. Just be aware of the orientation of the switch. What I'm showing is the disassemble but you can see that it's done in a set order. That makes sure that when I then put the switch back together, you know, I don't accidentally get one of the wafers in the wrong position or one of the uh, selection contacts in the wrong position and then reassemble. And then I've got issues where maybe one or two of the inputs are not being selected. 
and then when you're reinstalling it you have a locking nut which goes around the cage part but just ensure that you push down on the circuit board before you resolder the pins what you don't want to do is just have a small amount of the pin poking through and then just solder it it's not going to give you the mechanical strength that you that you require and then once that has then been done the next thing that i'm sort of turning my attention to is the uh, replacement of the fail mosfets now what i show in the video is the metal tabs which are removed they're like mounting plates so when you look from the back of the amplifier and you can see here there's fixing bolts that pass through and it's quite a substantial locking plate and i've sort of popped it onto the transformer just so you can see it just use a type 2 phillips screwdriver to remove the bolt and then you can see here and i've got the multimeter connected the right channel mosfet is short circuit and that is what has caused the fuse to blow now when you're replacing these mosfets just be aware that you must source them from reputable companies the whole market is flooded with counterfeit devices so if you go out sourcing them maybe for a few euros a few dollars or a few pounds there's probably a high chance that they're counterfeit and if you install them they may fail on power up and cause other issues within the amplifier or they may not perform or many other reasons so here these are sourced you know from musa and the open mosfets in this amplifier are irf international Rectif rectifier 640 ends now if you look at the service manual it'll talk about 540 ends well again nothing to be concerned there this is very common where manufacturers may use you know an uprated component and comes with the 640m because of the power output requirements it's a higher rated component than the 540n but both are the same device so once those have been replaced when you put the locking mechanism back in just be careful not to over tighten what you'll find is that there is a thermal insulator and also used then to transfer the heat to the heat sink and that's just to insulate the tab of the mosfet so it's not grounded through the heat sink but when you are tightening up the rear locking nut or rocking screw don't over tighten remember these are plastic package type devices so it's just firm but not over tighten then and remember that when you are doing all of the sort of soldering of the circuit board just scan around just make sure that you don't see any underlying dry solder joints sometimes on the plus or minus 15 volt regulators you may well see them um, but again look then to resolder now what is a common sort of issue with all older amplifiers is associated with the speaker protection relay so if this amplifier was indeed manufactured maybe you know 2002 sort of time frame that relay has operated literally thousands of times through its life and what you'll find is the current over time creates oxidization and what you'll have then is intermittent switching and it's very common that someone reports that if they tap the top of the speaker relay that all of a sudden the sound is restored and then it returns or they may hear distortion at low volume because the amount of current flowing to the output stage is much less than when it's higher powered so they're hearing distortion or again loss of sound so what you need to do here is to replace the relay and that's what i've done so that means that this amplifier should perform fault free then for decades and no issue of intermittent loss of sound or distortion associated then with the relay and then what i'm also showing as well is the amplifier mounted vertically and the reason for that is i'm just demonstrating that the amplifier complete with the circuit board rear back panel connected and also you can see the metal cage where the user control potentiometers and switches connect can be fully removed from the chassis and it's very very easy then to work on these rcam series of amplifiers and to make the necessary repairs then and then the other thing once that is all done is to ensure that you clean the other remaining user controls so if you use deoxid which is a very high quality um, contact cleaner you can spray it directly into the access ports on the user potentiometers and just rotate them backwards and forwards many many times and that will clean up the carbon tracks and excuse remove any sort of dirt or dust which as a operation you can sometimes hear like a crackling noise when you rotate these if you clean them then that will be all gone and then also into the selection switches as well so what i'm referring to there is the tape 
the direct mode and then speaker set to selection switch. And then finally, the last thing that you need to do is the adjustment then of the um, bias for the respective channels. Now, what I show in the video is the circuit diagram for the right channel because that was the failure for this amplifier. Now, the alignment procedure is the same. So when you replace one set of MOSFETs like we have with this amplifier, just be aware that you also need to check and adjust if required the bias adjustment then for the left channel. And the reason is that sometimes you'll find that the bias will be out. And in this case, it was. It was about 3.2 to 3.4 millivolts. So it wasn't within the required range, which should be 2.3 to 2.8. Now, that is nothing to be concerned about. I just want to sort of reinforce this point. It is not uncommon to get older amplifiers where you go to make an adjustment and the initial measurement is high. Remember the components age over time, they change in tolerance and realignment is perfectly normal. So what you're looking to do here and the manual for the service side will describe this. It will refer then to the preset adjustments. And here we have RV101 and then it also refers then as well to the 0.22 ohm resistor which is connected on the last output stage of the MOSFET and you connect your multimeter across there and then what you should be doing is when you first power up RV101 would be set to minimum and also, also the left channel RV1 would also be set to minimum as well so use or leave the amplifier on for about five minutes just for an initial warm-up and then slowly adjust the preset until you read, say, 2.5 millivolts. Adjust for both channels and then leave the amplifier running maybe for about 20 to 30 minutes. And that means that the amplifier is fully stabilised. It's been in operation then to warm through. And then you can then make your final adjustment then. Um, for this amplifier, because they're original devices which have been fitted, you know, the bias adjustment was seamless. You know, you could just adjust it very, very linearly right the way to 2.5 millivolts, extremely stable in operation and nothing, you know, sort of untoward. If you had counterfeit devices, believe you me, um, you may see a failure on power up or erratic behavior or the such issue. So just back to that same point, you know, it's going to cost you a little bit more money, but if you fit, you know, good devices, then that's going <clears> to <throat> remove any sort of rework and all those issues associated with that then. And then the only sort of final part is just to run the amplifier on the load test. And that's something which is done for about two, two, three hours. So all it means it's connected up to a load. The amplifier is running audio through there. You check in, obviously, symmetry with the oscilloscope prior to that to ensure that, you know, uniformity and then also both channels, you know, equal amplitude across the frequency range. And once the amplifier has been running for two or three hours, the only final stage then is to do a physical clean. So that's where you see that the front fascia is all cleaned up, also the outer casing. Um, sometimes you can get amplifiers where you get these sort of the, the rubber Arcam missing feet. Not in this case, but again, I can sort of carry all these sorts of items in stock. So it's not that I have to go back to Arcam then to go and get them. And then finally in the video, what I'm showing here is just the parts that were replaced. So you can see the Omron relay, that's the speaker one, and then the failed MOSFET devices then. So really that brings us to a conclusion now. So not a complex repair, I would say. But again, if you require any help or support or guidance, by all means, contact me via audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be more than happy to provide any insight or guidance that you may require. So all the best to everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Until the next time. Bye bye.